Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Adams, and uh, this is a, a special feature, maybe not that special, by the Icebox Radio Workshop, and it is entitled Convergence and Oral History. Um, I'm speaking to you on, uh, let's see, it is uh, June the 25th, 2016, uh, from my home in International Falls, Minnesota. And the reason I'm, I'm uh, talking about this is in about four days, five days, let's call it, there's going to be the beginning of a, uh, a tradition down south in the Twin Cities uh, in Bloomington, Minnesota. And that tradition is called Convergence. Convergence is a sci-fi convention, and it is uh, a rather big and I would say important part of my life. And I'm not going this year. And it's quite likely that this might be um, what happens every 4th of July weekend from now on. In other words, I'm not sure I'm going to be going back to Convergence. Nothing bad. There's no, uh, there's no horrible stories to tell. I just, uh, I just I'll go into that a little bit later. But because Convergence has been so important to my life and to my family's life, I really I felt the need to sit down and, and talk it out. You know, I work in radio. I work in audio drama. And I would rather talk than I would uh, sit down and try and write a blog. So you end up with this. You end up with a, a standalone podcast called An Oral History. To begin with, a little bit of background. The first convergence I ever attended was in 2003. And at the time, my family and I were living in a little town called Monmouth, Oregon. Um, and I had been for about, oh, about a year at that point. I'd been focusing my creative energies on audio drama or radio drama, whatever you want to call it, after having a fairly long and not very successful career as a writer where I tried to write mysteries and didn't get anywhere, tried to write plays and, and interested some people in those, uh, but just never really developed much in the way of a career. And uh, had, had been writing audio drama both uh, for a show called The Grist Mill from uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, and also for myself, for a little show I'd been doing online called uh, Imagination X. And uh, it was fun. It was very creative. It, got, it gave me a chance to do whatever I wanted to do. And almost as a lark, um, I found out about this award program called the Mark Time Ogle Awards that were handed out for the best science fiction and horror and fantasy audio every year. And I submitted, submitted a couple stories, and lo and behold... I got recognized. I won. Well, I didn't win because I won a silver ogle, which is, I guess, second place for the, in the horror category. And then another story I'd done, uh, that was for a, a story called Up on the Rooftops that I made with my, my daughter, Rachel, kind of a Christmas kid show horror piece. And the other show I did was called Background, which was actually my favorite of the, of the year. That got a honorable mention uh, from the ogle awards. Now, the thing I should explain about doing audio drama in 2003 is none of us expected to be making a living at this. None of us, none of us could have foreseen the rise of podcasting at that point and the rise of shows like The Truth and Welcome to Night Vale and Alice Isn't Dead and Serial. So we were kind of doing it hopefully, uh, but also just for fun. And I think I really needed a boost at that point. And my wife, God bless her, her generous soul, she saw that. And so when these awards came up, even though we were living in Oregon and the awards were going to be handed out in Minneapolis, she said, you know what, why don't you go? Uh, plane tickets were pretty cheap at that point. We can afford a, a round-trip flight. They're going to take care of hotel and, and, uh, and uh, admission to the convention. Why don't you just go ahead and go? And I jumped at the chance because not only would I get a chance to get these awards, but I would get a chance to meet other people who won awards, which means I would be meeting other audio drama producers, kind of an amazing thing. And as a bonus, the, the guy who'd gotten me started in audio, Scott Hickey from Lowell, Massachusetts, and his show, The Grist Mill, he was going to be flying out just for fun. You know, he wasn't getting an award or anything, but he just wanted to come out and, and hang out with uh, two friends of his, Brian Price and Jerry Stearns, they of Great Northern Audio Theater. And I, I said, what the heck, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fly out. Now, I should point out, or at least clarify, that this to me was all about these awards. It was all about the Mark Time Ogle Awards. The fact that it was all taking place at a science fiction convention, just basically, I could not care less about that, that little tidbit. Um, I thought it would be interesting. I thought it would be fun. I'd never been to one, never really felt like going to one. 
But no, I was there to meet other audio producers, hang out, and get this award. So I flew into Minneapolis, and I remember meeting Scott Hickey by accident at the uh, the uh, ground transportation place they used to have then, where the uh, at the time the what was, what was it? Now here's a good question: What was the hotel at the time? I believe it was the Radisson in 2003. Um, the Radisson still had buses that they would take you to and from the airport. And, uh, he was there. We just met by accident, had a wonderful time, got to the hotel, um, and, and got through, uh, opening ceremonies preceded, of course, by the Mark Time radio show, which featured, uh, featured David Osman of Firesign Theater. I remember that being a really big deal. They actually had a guy from Firesign Theater, someone that I had listened to all the way up through high school and college and had four or five of the, of their albums on vinyl and, um, got the award and enjoyed that very much. They play a little clip from your show when you're standing there on stage. And I remember people in the audience going, Ooh, and the, le- the rest of opening ceremonies rolled out. I don't even remember what the skit was that year, but I remember being amazed at the talent on display. And I remember beginning to get the idea that maybe the sci-fi convention wouldn't be quite the lark that I thought it was going to be. In hindsight, all I can say is that that first year was like breathing pure oxygen. It was like I was alive again. Walking through the halls like you do, right? You you start out up by the bridge, looking out over the, the cabana area on the balcony, and then walking around the circuit. Everything was just amazing. Uh, discovering what con suites was was just amazing. You mean they feed you? You can actually get food? I think at one point I happened by when the pizza was there, and you know that only lasts like 10 minutes at, at the most. And just being amazed by the whole experience. Scott and I, uh, Scott said, hey, we, I, I want to go see this concert from this guy uh, who's on the Dr. Demento show these days called The Great Luke Ski. And I'd never heard of The Great Luke Ski and and just was <laughs> amazed by everything about it. And as the days went on, and it was a three-day con in those days, I just it, it just piled on top of each other. And at one point, I think I was almost, you know, I was almost ready to have a little bit of an emotional breakdown. Not a bad one, but like tears of joy type thing. Because it was as if parts of me that had been locked away when I was 12 and 13 years old and trying to read comics and play D&D with my my geekier friends, I had always kind of, I'd always kind of had an interesting relationship with that world because I loved it, but I also liked sports and I was kind of a, uh, I was kind of a dabbler, a dilettante. I did a lot of different things. And it was like that part of my life had been, that part of my brain anyway, had been locked away for so long. And that was all coming back. And creatively, it meant everything. Because for the first time, I wasn't trying to be a professional. I was, I was recognizing or remembering that to create in fiction, you have to have a little bit of that spark, that little bit of that, that, that kid, little kid spark in your mind to create beautiful and engaging works of fiction. And it was like it had been shut down. And Convergence woke it up. Well... That first year was interesting because I was just buzzing all the way home. I remember, I remember I had, uh, I I bought gum for the plane, right? Like you do sometimes you get gum so you can chew gum on takeoff and landing and your ears won't pop quite so bad. And I remember holding on to that gum in my, in my bag for months afterwards. Cause I would, you know, how a, a smell is like the best sense for retrieving memory. And when I would smell that bag, I would remember what it was like to fly to Convergence. It was all just so beautiful. And I, I got home, flew back into Portland, and my wife and kids were there, and I was just buzzing, was telling them all about it, and they were going, wow, that sounds like a, f- a lot of fun. That sounds really great. Okay. But even then, even initially, I kind of had the idea that we were just BSing each other. Um, we were a family of four in those days. And the kids were young, and I worked intermittently at temp jobs and in a museum, and my wife was a, my wife was a children's librarian. And, and we were fine, but we weren't, you know, we weren't to the point where we could pay for four plane tickets and hotel and everything else. And you know, we didn't really take real vacations. We were one of those families that a vacation was going to see, like, Grandma and Grandpa, 
where somebody else would watch the kids and, and cook for a couple of days and the kids got to play with grandma and grandpa. That was, you know, we, we didn't go to Disneyland. Let's put it that way. Um, so having this conversation after I got back from my first convergence was, uh, was kind of amazing, but also I knew, you know, deep down, well, there's nothing's going to happen here. We're not actually going to do this. Even though my wife was saying, well, maybe we should think about it. I think she saw what it had meant to me, or at least saw the, the, the glimmer in my eyes that maybe hadn't been there in a while. But I thought, well, that was that. So this would have been July of 2003. Um, little background, we were living in, as I say, Monmouth, Oregon, and we were Pacific Northwest people. My wife and I had both grown up there. We met there and married there. Uh, we had only lived in the Pacific Northwest, the states of Oregon or Washington, our whole time, basically our whole lives. My wife was actually born in Colorado, but moved when she was two. So we were Pac and W people. And then everything changed very unexpectedly. And I don't know if you want to call it, depending on your personal beliefs, if you want to call it a God thing or the fates or it was meant to be or however you want to put it. If you, um, if you take that moment in July after I got back for Convergence, less than six months later, we were living in Minnesota. Totally unexpected. It was an opportunity that my wife took up and we talked about, and we talked about it a long time and decided, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to jump. We're going to give her an opportunity and I will find something to do. And we're just, we're going to go to Minnesota. We're going to go 2000 miles away to a place where we have no family far away from our existing family. And it all happened really, really amazingly fast. And, and somewhere around that first January, when we moved to Minnesota, not just Minnesota, incidentally, but international falls, you know, the very blank end of Minnesota, way up on the border. It occurred to me, you know what? I could actually drive to convergence this year. What an awesome idea. And as it happened, before we left, I'd made this uh, this particularly good audio drama with a friend of mine named David Ian, who still works in radio in, in Portland, called The Convergence. I actually made a three-part Imagination X series based upon a sci-fi convention saving the world, or the members at the sci-fi convention saving the world. And it it, it just, uh, I you know, went ahead and planned to submit this, and then lo and behold, I got a better award. I got a gold Mark Time Award for The Convergence in 2004. And uh, that next year, I was just incredibly jazzed. I couldn't wait to get that feeling back. I couldn't, you know, the, uh, the theme that year, I remember, was like noir, film noir, which is a thing I dearly love. I was getting a gold mark time. I made a bunch of copies of this disc. I didn't think a lot of copies. I thought, well, I'll sell a dozen copies at least, and that'll be like, that'll be like, you know, $15 each. That'll pay for the trip. Everything was going great. This was going to be awesome. And Convergence 2004 was still to this day the most disappointing one I'd ever been to. Um, it was very simply, my expectations were just too high. That's all. My expectations were just too high. They're completely unrealistic. The family had been through this tremendous upheaval and, and, uh, it was just, it was just too much. I expected too much from the con. It was a fine con. It was a good con. Uh, the film noir, uh, set up, I think was, was a wonderful thing to do. Had a great time with that, especially cinema Rex, because there was so much, uh, so many wonderful movies, about uh the, from the film noir genre excuse me that was my phone um but 2004 was not my favorite con let's just put it that way so starting in 2005 something once again changed um one one i got invited to be part of the mark time radio show for the first time jerry stearns and brian price who produced great northern audio theater uh, in those days, always did the live radio show right before opening ceremonies. And uh, th they had asked me to come down and do a couple of parts. And I, of course, acquiesced. I said, I I'd love to. Secondly, for the first time, my son came with me, who was in those days, I'm going to get my math wrong, but I want to say he was about 13, 12 or 13 years old. And it it was it was kind of a tough con. I remember we couldn't afford the hotel room for all four nights because... Uh, we, uh, how do you put, oh, I had to be there early for the Mark Time show. So we ended up sleeping in the car one night. That was, I wouldn't recommend that <laughs> with a 13 year old boy. And I'm sure he wouldn't recommend it with a 30 some year old man or 40 some year old man at that point. Uh, but that was, that was a really good con that I remember for one particular moment. 
uh, Stephen, my son, had discovered the land room up on the 22nd floor. In those days, it was relatively easy to take the elevator up to the 22nd floor. And he came in. It was about 1.30 in the morning. And uh, I was already in bed watching TV. And he came in. And, and Stephen is always, he's one of those kids. He was 13 going on 35. And he's saying, well, you know, I just, it's, it's getting late. I really should go to bed. And I said, you know, Stephen, it's con. If you want to stay up, you can stay up. Because I don't think they actually shut down the land room in those days. And the look on his face, the realization, you know, it was, it was like Flash from Zootopia when he saw that uh, it was his friend that was the cop. Just that smile that sort of spread brightly. That was, that was the moment I remember most with him going, yeah, this is Khan. And it was like we both realized it's Khan. That means the rules don't apply. <laughs> and his mother wasn't there, so I could get away with that. And that, that was the beginning of a new trend. Because the next year, his sister, who was four years younger, came. And she just had a great time just walking around, absorbing everything. And I think it was the year after that, I had these two kids who really, really wanted to go. This was now bigger than Christmas in our family. We were going to Convergence. In fact, every Christmas I gave, the, I would make sure we got our memberships. And I would print them out and roll them up and put them in their stocking. And that was like one of the best... Pr- presence of the year. We're going back to Convergence. And and Rachel, we had discovered Firefly for that point. Rachel had her first River costume. And I, I was once again in the Mark Time radio show, this time I believe with Wally Wingert. And uh, Rachel was the applause sign girl. They gave her a big sign that said applause. And people just went crazy because here was this, she must have been about 12 or 13 herself by that point. And here she was just jumping up and down, um, waving this applause sign. <laughs> And that's probably my, my favorite memory of her. I was on stage. I didn't see it, but there's a picture in our family archives that someone took of her waving that applause sign. And she was just, he was, she was so great. And the next, uh, the next big um, milestone for Convergence was 2008. Now, after moving to International Falls, Minnesota, I decided I didn't want to just, you know, make audio drama out of my garage anymore. I wanted to build something. I wanted to make a group, a theater. And so I started the Icebox Radio Theater. And that started in 2004. By 2008, we kind of figured things out. We knew somewhat what we were doing. And uh, we got a grant, which was you know, part of the experiment, learning how to write grants. We got a grant to go to Convergence and do live shows, two live shows over the weekend. And I was so excited because I had all these friends now from the theater, and I wanted to show them convergence the wonders of convergence and of course my kids were thrilled they got to go finally my wife acquiesced to go she was she still did a lot of children's programming and when you do a children's librarianship that means summer reading and summer reading means you really can't leave like in late june early july it's just a bad time to be out of the library so she always even though she always wanted to go she probably loves fantasy and sci-fi more than i do uh, she always kind of hemmed and hawed said i don't think i can make it 2008 was the year she finally made it, and we were all there together for the first time. And it was so awesome, except for the shows themselves. <laughs> because let me tell you something. If you've never done a thing at Convergence, if you've never sat a panel or done a show, when you do that, you discover something. And what you discover is um, there's a lot going on at Convergence. <laughs> and competing for people's attention, getting them to come to your event is really tough because, you know, you got two 24-hour movie rooms and all the panels and the number of times people just kind of hang out on the balcony next to the bridge looking out at the scene. It was all, it was all a very big, uh, very, very big trying time. But in the middle of that, the one group of people who I thought would never enjoy the convention ended up becoming absolutely addicted. And that's my good friend, the Irwin family. Um, I brought a lot of people with us uh, to go to this con uh, in 2008. The Irwins, it was Dave Irwin was my sound effects director. And uh, he decided his whole family was going to come, which surprised me because, you know, they're, they're, they're good Christian folks. They're from Fort Francis, Ontario. Never will forget, they showed up and there had been a snafu with their room. And here we are on Thursday, uh, the big move-in time for the con. And because there had been this snafu, they were holding hands in a circle praying. And the number of people walking by, just looking at them with eyes the size of saucers, they just, you know, this this was not, we still aren't very good about mixing different viewpoints in this culture. And this was not something people expected to see. And uh, a shout out right now to Ishmael, 
who fixed it for him, got him a room in the hotel because that's the kind of miracle worker that Ishmael is. And obviously he's, he's technically an angel now because this all happened because of prayer. Um, Irwin's got absolutely addicted to convergence and they came back every year since then. And as a matter of fact, this year they're going back and I'm not, you know, it's, uh, it makes me sad every year when we get to this part of the, of the season and I, uh, and I'm not going to con one more milestone to mention. And that was the first year that my daughter, Sarah went. Now, Sarah is not ours biologically. Sarah is a girl here from international falls who uh, had kind of a rough growing up. And I won't go into all of her details because it's her story. Uh, but Sarah joined our family as about a 17 or 18 year old and put herself through college at Hamlin university, go Pipers. And the first time she went to Convergence, I, I remember her kind of looking around somewhat frightened because we were, you know, we were in line to register and it was all very chaotic. And I think there was some kind of problem with her registration. We ended up paying twice. And then later, just with a couple of emails, uh, got, I got my money back, you know, cause that's the kind of people that run Convergence. And, and then I remember her discovering boffing, uh, the foam sword fights in the cabana that pretty much go nonstop during the con. And that's where Sarah wanted to be. That Sarah really, really, really wanted to be there doing that all the time. And I think she went at least one more year. It was probably the next year that her mother made for her, my wife made for her and her sister, Rachel steampunk dresses because steampunk was sort of the, uh, sort of the, the theme of that year. I think it was tomorrow through the past was the name of the theme. And they had these beautiful steampunk dresses which their their brother then bought a couple steampunk accessories like a top hat and a cane and took a picture with them and that's probably you know the closing closing thought i have about convergence i have that picture in my office and the minute i saw the three of them in their outfits i thought of a story and it's unlike any story i've ever written um it's a story that i call the flight of the byzantine and although it's a steampunk in subject matter I'm not spending much time on, you know, why the gears work the way they do. I am not doing that at all. I am spending all of my time on this family that was broken apart by war and is now rejoined and is, is trying to fight their way through a war-torn landscape um, to reunite with their father, whom they thought dead but discovered was not. And I'm working on that book now, and I'm really excited about it. It's one of the few times I've sat down with a story and just... I'm excited working and it's exciting to be back working fiction again. And again, it was all because of convergence. I'm not sure where convergence 